Today, our fissured identity and a fisher king. Welcome to Coffee with Kramer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Kramer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. I don't, I don't ever want to be misleading in these little introductions that we do. So I will clarify that although we will talk about the Fisher King, that's the goal today, to get to that point, and then we can run to the conclusion from there, uh, it's not a full exp- explanation. We're not, we're not going to explore in depth the Grail legends or any of the things that surround that. But there is something from... Um, a certain analysis of the Grail legends that I think is worth concluding uh, our discussion today. And so uh, that's how we're we're going to kind of come at it from that direction. How do we arrive at that point? If you don't know anything about what a Fisher King is or what I even mean by the Grail legends, uh, that would be an explanation you would find in other episodes that we've done or conversations about it or by reading other materials about the King Arthur legends and all of those things, uh, we would have those discussions in a different context. But you'll understand why we get there, hopefully, by the time we do today. Although, it's a pretty good journey, so we need to head that way. I have had prior conversations on the subject matter, the the real core of the subject matter today. Not, not the meaning, not the purpose for today, but just the core content that... Uh, informs what we're going to be talking about today. I've talked about it before. Uh, We did a couple of episodes, or maybe three, uh, called Disagreeing to Agree, back when we were beginning the podcast. Uh, You know, the first 20 episodes or so, somewhere in there, uh, there were a couple of episodes called Disagreeing to Agree. Uh, And that had a lot to do with understanding our identity as individuals, but who also live within a community and understanding how those two things tie together, how those two parts of our identity ties together. And we underestimate the importance of both of those parts in our culture. And I find it a a disservice to our Christian ethic, a, a disservice to our understanding of our relationship with other people, and therefore a disservice to understanding who we are that we don't grasp how important this topic is. And so I want to start today with just a reminder of what this is about in, 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 sort of in, in a light way, in, in a, and I don't mean by that a joking way. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of philosophy today. Well, not philosophy. There's a lot of uh, just analysis today that we have to start with. So I'll try to give some practical examples along the way to keep you uh, engaged, but also to connect it to where we actually are. Because for me, this is not abstract. It's not theory that makes it interesting. It is the real application of it, the practical impact that this has on the way we live and basic choices that we make in our society right now and among ourselves as believers, uh, which needs to be addressed. And so uh, where I'm starting is with just a recognition of the inherent or necessary tension that exists between uh, understanding ourselves as individuals who are isolated, uh, it's just me against the world kind of picture of ourselves, uh, and that's, you know, something we're very proud of as Americans. You know, we're all individualists, and we do our own thing, and don't let anyone else dictate to you who you are and all that, which is fine and true. It's, it is a part of our identity. But we, we ignore in some ways the necessary tension that exists between that understanding of ourselves and the relationship that we have with others and the impact that that has on understanding who we are. And in order to grasp that, the way we understand ourselves both as an individual and as part of a community, 
It starts with understanding the necessary tension that exists between ourselves and others, with the fact that we understand ourselves in contrast to other people. And this sounds juvenile or it sounds simplistic, but in reality, it's, it's a very complex part of who we are. You know, if you look back historically at figures you don't know, I don't know, none of us know because they're dead and they've been dead for millennia or at least centuries, we understand who those people are because of the people they weren't. That is, I understand who Plato and Aristotle are and the way I describe them because they were Greek. Well, they weren't all those other Greek people. Plato was just himself. He was just Plato. And yet I know who Plato is because he was among people who were not him, right? So Plato is a Greek. Aristotle is a Greek. Alexander the Great was Macedonian. Attila was a Hun. They sh- and, and our understanding of who their people were, of what it was to be Greek or Macedonian or a Hun, is shaped by what we think of Plato and Alexander and Attila. I don't know much about Attila. I'm just saying it's fun to say Attila the Hun, you know? It's just a nice thing to say. And, but also this, the fact that they were a part of that community shapes what we think of them. You think of Plato differently because you know he was a Greek. He was among other Greeks. And so in us, there's also this necessary tension. And I mean in us, like right here, right now, among us, it's impossible that we that, that we would avoid thinking in terms of I and they, you know, I versus they. That's an easy one. Obviously, we have to think about I and they, which, by the way, by itself, just saying there's me and then there's them, right? I'm putting, putting those in quotes so you won't get upset about me using the objective case when I'm, when I'm using something that should be a subject compliment. I'm fine with that. I get that. Fine. But me and them, or I and they, are different. Even that concept entails that I'm putting the they, that's in quotes, in a category that's shared by I, me. (laughs) The I was in quotes that time. Y'all want me to let go of the grammar? Okay, fine. I'll let go of the grammar. Let's just talk about the subject matter, right? So this this is the point of being able to say, the word they. I mean, I have to be in a bad place to use the word they when I'm talking about a rock or a volleyball, you know? Well, I threw him at you, you know, a volleyball or a rock or whatever it was. I'm choosing volleyball, yes, as a slight homage to, uh, what's it called? Cast Away. That's the movie, yes. You know, you got to be in a bad place before you think of that other object as a they, but even in that category, you're you're elevating the significance of that object to something else. So when you are among other people and you say, well, they are, you're already recognizing that you are in some category that you share with them, right? Okay, so that part is just sort of built into saying there's something different about me and you. But in the same way, we don't just say I versus they. We say we I'm doing it right now. I'm putting you in this in this boat with me. And yeah, we're trying to get back to our volleyball. Just kidding. But in this boat with me, we are also in a, in a contrast, in a contrasted state versus they. So it's we and they. And, and this is nothing more complicated than what we, what we see in Scripture when Paul is standing on the steps of the, you know, the, the, the uh, temple mount. Uh, and being carried away to Antonio's fortress where he's going to be arrested, you know, or held under arrest for his own safety, by the way. He was being beaten to a pulp by the crowd. The, all of that is taking, you know, when when Paul is saying to them, you know, God called me to go and minister to the Gentiles. He's saying, there's a me. I was confronted by God on the road to Damascus. I'll give more to this later. 
just mentioning it in passing now so you know the context of what I'm talking about. So Paul is talking about his own testimony. I personally was doing this and that. I was on the way to Damascus. Jesus confronted me. I acknowledged his resurrection. I accepted him as Lord. He sent me the rest of the way. And then God gave me this purpose and this mission so that we as a people could fulfill his will for us as Jews. But he also told me to go to the Gentiles, the they. So, you know, there's a recognition for Paul that there's something about him and the people he's speaking to, the Jews that he's speaking to, that puts them in the same category, even though he's his own individual. And then there's something about them together, that is, Paul and the Jews who are standing there listening to him, that puts them in a different category than the Gentiles, right? So you've got an I versus they and a we versus they that are both present, just in that case in Acts 22, which again, I'll refer to more as we get uh, further into the discussion. I'm saying all of that simply to say, just by our existence in this world as human beings, which are inherently social beings, we automatically have to think of ourselves, in, just in order to know what we are or who we are, as I and we and in contrast to they. That's just an inherent part of what we are. And if you're, if you're thinking to yourself, who really cares about that? Hang with me for just another minute. There is in, in Scripture, and I'm, I'll put it this, in these terms because I'm talking about Christian ethics today. The, in Scripture, there's something inherently important, and I mean centrally important, to recognizing and then moderating or even eliminating, and of course the ultimate goal is to eliminate them, but recognizing and moderating and eliminating any abuses that are associated with those dis distinctions. Now, obviously, we don't want any abuses whatsoever, and, and yet it turns out that most of the time we're able to perpetrate abuses on other people, and, and just saying the word other there sort of makes the point, doesn't it? It's because we're able to make a distinction between the way we think about them and the way we think about ourselves, whether it's ourselves as individuals or ourselves as a part of a group of people to whom we would never do that. So the, in, in Scripture, it's fundamental that we have to eliminate any kinds of abuses that are associated with the distinctions we make between ourselves and other people. The distinctions are not the error. They're not the thing that's false. An individual is distinct from his community. Individuals do things alone. That's respectable and fine, and it's a part of our identity that we ought to keep and we ought to cause to flourish. I have no problem whatsoever. An individual is distinct from his community. That's fine, or her community. And so, as an example, a white man's experience in America, I can talk about this, I'm a white man in America, is different than the experience of any person of color. Now, I know that because I've lived the life of a white man, and I know it because I know some people of color, and I know the way they describe their experiences is different than anything I would ever say about a lot of the experiences I've had. At the, at the same moment, by the way, I'm acknowledging that I can talk about those experiences in comparison with each other because some of the experiences are the same. I mean, uh, the way we enjoy certain foods can be identical. The way we talk about some parts of our relationships can be identical. That's fine. But recognizing that the overall experience is distinctive is just a part of recognizing that there is something about our identity that allows us to see the difference between us and other people. Distinctions between us and others are not you know, even recognizing distinctions between us and other people is not a sin. That's not, that's not the problem. And I don't even think it's the sociological problem. There are disagreements about that. We can talk about that in just a moment. But, and, and by the way, for, forget being a white man in America and having distinction from the experience of a person of color. An American's experience, any American's experience or identity is different than that of almost any person from practically any other culture in the world. Even the ones that are most similar to ours, the European cultures that are most similar to American cultures in the world, 
Uh, I won't go into the details here, but I mean, the example that immediately came to my mind when I was writing down that sentence was the gate uh, comparison between Europeans and Americans. Just the fact that a lot of Europeans can look at a person walking and will say, oh, well, that's an American. It doesn't mean their prejudice is always right. It doesn't mean every American walks that way or walks in a way that's similar enough to be identified. But it is common for Americans to be identified that way. And I was reading uh, just a minute ago something that, uh, because I had been reminded of this from reading it a decade ago, in The Atlantic, there was a little compilation they started keeping of quotations from people that were indicators that in subtle ways that they had no idea, they didn't even know what they were, in subtle ways, people were able to pick them out as Americans when they were doing nothing, when they thought, well, I haven't even, I haven't said anything, I haven't done anything yet, and yet I walk up and they start speaking to me in, in, in English, uh, knowing that I'm an American and wondering why I'm there. What is it that's different about me? And some of those things were, you know, the gate, whether, wh- whether you were willing to make eye contact or not, for instance, things like that. Uh, in our honor ceremony recently, in, uh, it, it, I called it the honor ceremony, it's a, uh, it's a ceremony where we recognize graduates who've accomplished some special thing. And so we were recognizing one graduate, and uh, as she gave her testimony, uh, she mentioned that she had had to learn in American culture to make eye contact with people, because in her culture, that was considered disrespectful. But in American culture, it was considered important, especially in the type of ministry uh, that she was trying to engage in, to be able to look a person in the eyes and speak with them. Although it felt to her like she was being disrespectful that, to that person because in her culture, she would have looked down all the time. Little differences like that make every, every single culture different from other cultures, and it makes the individuals who are in that culture distinct from those other cultures, and it gives us a way of saying, well, I'm like this, but they are like that. It gives us an I and they distinction. It's not evil. It's just different. Different cultures are different. People are different. That's why we talk about we and they in contrast with each other. And there are all kinds of sources of those differences. There are all different kinds of ways of measuring those differences. And there are different kinds of outcomes that can come from it. It could affect things or not affect things as a result. Speaking different languages, using different colloquialisms, different metaphors, different idioms changes the way you think about the world around you. Uh, just the, I mean, just the way you grow up, the type of environment you grow up in, the livelihood that you have when you're growing up. Uh, uh, somebody growing up in a rural area in some agrarian economy is going to think about the world and think about other people differently than someone growing up in an urban capitalist uh, economy. It's going to be a completely different sense of who you are. doesn't mean they can't communicate with each other. doesn't mean they can't respect each other. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying just recognizing distinctions between individuals and then between types of people or groups of people or demographics is not the problem that we need to talk about, and it's not an issue that needs to be solved. It's just something we should recognize. Okay, fine. There are differences. And and it's not the goal to pretend that those differences don't exist. It's That's not something that would accomplish what, what we want as believers. And so I've, for instance, there's a, a refrain more commonly expressed now than I I can't say than ever it was, but more than I had heard before. Uh, And that's the refrain from some black authors, for instance, I've read, who've said something like this, that when they heard a statement like this, well, I didn't see him as a black man about themselves, for instance. So speaking of a black author in this case, I just saw him as a man. I didn't see him as a black man. That that black author realized in hearing that that what they were saying was that they could not see him for who he actually was, that they couldn't accept his entire identity because part of who he is is a black man. That's, and, and I'm just refer, I'm referring you to what I've heard other authors say about their identity. The idea that a lot of us have in the back of our minds is that if we can just be, and the common expression for it now is colorblind, that if we can just be colorblind, then we will have eliminated the problem. Uh, Unfortunately, that's not where the problem lies. People are different from each other, and it's okay 
that people are different from each other and that we have different backgrounds and that we have different priorities about what we're doing. It's part of the beauty of different parts of humanity making the rest of humanity more complete, just like different parts of the body of Christ make the body of Christ more complete. We've had discussions about that whole thing. It's it's funny that in the realization, and for, for instance, particularly right now, I'm thinking of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, you know, that that book, that novel, which I, I, I'm not recommending either way. I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a magnificent work of literature, and it is revelatory. I mean, it's from the 1950s, you know, right in the middle of Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South. Uh, it's a magnificent declaration of this, that it doesn't seem possible, no matter what form he takes, no matter what iteration in popular imagination a black man takes in this novel, I'm saying this is one way of understanding the novel or parts of the novel, that no matter what form he takes, no matter what, uh, what, what pattern he follows in the popular imagination about what it is to be a black man in America in 1952, that he's still, as a, as a soul, he's still going to be invisible in that world. Uh, and the way Ralph Ellison accomplishes that, I find just mystifyingly beautiful. It's a it's a powerful book, The Invisible Man. It, it, I mean, it's just called Invisible Man. But that's the that's the point in his book. Uh, and I'm not saying his point is we shouldn't. The color blindness is not the point. I'm not saying he's making my point. I'm saying that's part of what you walk away with is learning that whether you're seeing it or not seeing it, there's still going to be a problem there to deal with. And there's plenty of disagreement about what to do with that, uh, about, you know, what to do with the fact that we should or shouldn't be colorblind and all that kind of stuff. And you can imagine why, because there are plenty of human beings who are having to deal with it. There are people who are just I, they are, they are just that one person and they have a way of dealing with it that might be different from a lot of the they's or the we's that are around them. It's just the nature of humanity that we are in all of those categories at one time. So there's plenty of room for disagreement there as well. And but 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 I do want to make this point that no matter what we're talking about, and it doesn't matter now whether we're talking about race or uh, upbringing or uh, socioeconomic status or whatever it is, it, it that whatever you're talking about, it takes a lot of security, a lot of self confidence, a lot of maturity to be an outsider among a bunch of insiders and still be comfortable in your own skin. That's not common. Uh, and I, I look, I'm, I mean, at 60 years old, as the president of an institution, I've pastored, I do public speaking, I, I love to, to do all those kinds of things, and I've done them in all kinds of settings. It's still really awkward to be in a place where you know you're an outsider and everybody knows you're an outsider and how you fit in there is, you know, it's, it's difficult. You want to just sort of disappear. And, and so whether it's about race or upbringing or locality or the denomination you're a part of in religion or scholarship or economic, and, and I mean by that, how well educated are you? And are you educated in our specific discipline? Do you know the things that we talk about and the magic words that we use? or if it's economic status. In all those categories, it is a challenge to figure out how to meld together or to blend together or to recognize the distinctions about but see them woven together, uh, the difference between I and we and they. And, And by the way, none of those categories, race, upbringing, locality, denomination, scholarship, economic status, the ones I just listed, none of those categories are mutually exclusive. So for people who say, well, I don't even see race, and by the way, all this controversy is not about race, it's just socioeconomic status that matters, it can be both. They're not mutually exclusive. They could be related, they could be interrelated, they could be inextricable from each other, but they can still be two different categories that we're talking about. I will say this for the people who say, well, there's not, there's not any race. I don't even know why people talk about it. There's only, there's only the human race. And I've heard people say this in my context in the Baptist world. I just, you know, I'll just read the Baptist faith and message, uh, which is just sort of a simple doctrinal statement among Baptists, where we say, well, this is sort of the basis of where we are. In 2000, I actually added a phrase to clarify this. 
The sacredness of human personality is evident, and I'm, I'm quoting from the Baptist Faith and Message now, the sacredness of human personality is evident in that God created man in his own image and in that Christ died for man. Therefore, every person of every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love. We understand what it means to recognize that there are different races and yet also identify the equality in every meaningful way of that person. So, uh, you know, the, the, the tension comes because to see fully the other person, the person who is different from you in some way, is to identify the things that do make them different from you. So you see in them that there is something different in them. They say, well, they speak a different language, or they look different than I do. They had a different upbringing. They're celebrating different holidays. They came from a different background. Whatever it is, you recognize the things that are different about you. By recognizing the differences, you're acknowledging, obviously, that there are comparables, that there are things that are alike about you. But to recognize those differences, this is the importance of recognizing that the other person, that you recognize them fully as a person, but as an other, you know, somebody who's in a different category than you. It means also not just to see the things that are different from you, but to recognize that those differences are only meaningful because they occur in a context of moral equality with you. In other words, a a rock is different from you but it's not important that it's different from you. When a human being is different from you because of any of those major factors, the thing that makes that difference important is that you have an equal moral standing with them and they have an equal moral standing with you. That's how we're supposed to see other people. Yeah, you're different than I am. And yet we have exactly the same moral footing in this world and before God. And that's what Paul is dealing with in Acts 22, which I I don't want to take very long on right now because I want to get through this whole topic today to get to the conclusion. But in Acts 22, you know, when Paul, as I was describing, he'd been, uh, you know, there was a riot stirred up about him because he was in the temple, and then the guards, they, they rush out, the Romans try to stop the riot, take Paul, they're going to put him under house arrest, he stops on the steps up to the, to the fortress, gives his speech, as I was mentioning a moment ago, and I just want to give, I just want to point out how clearly Luke uh, emphasizes the challenge that comes when people who view themselves as a part of a we group, this is just us, when they're told that they have to accept a they group. What? You mean we're going to have to let our doors open to them? It is devastating, and it is central to how we function as people who find some way to make ourselves different from everyone else. So here's how obvious it is in the way Luke teaches it. Luke gives us Paul's testimony. Paul is standing on the steps. He's speaking to the Jews who were trying to beat him to death just a minute ago. And he's speaking to them, and he says, well, I was on my way to Damascus, had this great vision. This is all in Acts 22. I'm around verse 6 right now. You can just read it later, and you'll get the whole story. But he, but he gives the testimony of his conversion. I'm on my way to Damascus. I'm going to persecute some people. I know that probably ticked some of y'all off, but, you know, it was my normal thing back then. So I'm going up to Damascus. I'm going to kill a few Christians. And this great light shines and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I said, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth. You would think the Jews would get upset about that, wouldn't you? Nope, they don't care. They're just listening to his testimony. Wow, that's fascinating. Listen to those guys speak, and they're totally quiet. So I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Why, who are you persecuting? And and those who were with me saw the light, Paul says. And so I, it's not just me. And I said, what do I do, Lord? And he said, well, go to Damascus, and you'll be told what you ought to do. And, and so Paul goes, and he's converted. He's telling the testimony to these people on the steps. And as he tells the testimony, he says, and you know what God said to me through this messenger that he sent, Ananias, who would, you know gave him back his sight and all that? Ananias said to me, Paul says to the crowd, God of our, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. The God of our fathers appointed you to see the righteous one, Jesus, and to hear a voice from his mouth. 
And none of the Jews are upset about this. Oh, they had testimony. Jesus, he saw Paul. He told Paul who he was. He revealed himself to him. Ananias confirmed that. Sure enough, that was the righteous one. That's Jesus. Our real Messiah has come. Uh, We're okay with all this, Paul. Keep talking. We're very interested in what you're saying. For you will be, Paul goes on to say, Ananias told me from the mouth of God, for you will be a witness for him to every one of whom you've seen and uh, every one of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Call on the name of Jesus. Ananias is saying all of this. I got baptized, Paul says, and the Jews are all like, happy day, fine, we don't care. Go ahead. We were going to kill you a minute ago, but we're okay with you right now. And then Paul says, and I came back to Jerusalem. I went in the temple. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just doing the things I'm supposed to do. People are beating me to death and so on. He says, I was there when Stephen was killed. And uh, he said in verse 21, he said to me, God said to me, this is, this is what Paul is saying to the Jews who are listening to him. And God said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Luke immediately stops the narrative there and says this, up to this word, they listened to him. This word, uh, God will send you away to the Gentiles. The resurrected Jesus appeared to me on the road to Damascus, told me that he is Lord and the righteous one, and that if I would worship him, be baptized and follow him, that I would be his servant. They're all fine with any of that. But when he says, and I'm going to go invite the Gentiles into this, up to this word, they listen to it. Then they raise their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. This is how fundamental to our way of thinking, our ability to discount the value of others is. We, we find some group, we find some line between us and them, and we say, oh, well, that they're not like us. We, we, can, we can treat them however we want, and don't tell me. I've got to tear down that line and let those people in. I'm not just talking about immigration here. That, that's not the point. You're missing the metaphor, and it's not even a metaphor. You're missing the point if that's what you're hearing right now. It's not a wrong application, but that's not the point that I'm making. We create lines between us and other people, and we are willing to do a lot to defend those lines. And our Christian ethic doesn't like that line. And that's what I'm pointing out today. So making sense of our theological convictions is a lot easier once we realize that our personal and our community identities are always coexisting. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't expect you to jump on that sentence and say, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense from what you've said so far. I'm drawing a conclusion that I'm going to make for you in just a minute. This is the point. But I want you to know where I'm going here. If we could grasp that, that our personal identity, the me, the I, is so wrapped up in what it is to be a part of the we, you know, the community that I belong to, that those, that those two parts of who I am, my personal identity, my community identity, that those coexist constantly, necessarily, that would open my, open my eyes to grasp why the ethic of Scripture is what it is. So, you know, I'll put it first in terms of our guilt, and then I'll put it in terms of of our salvation. In terms of our guilt, it looks like this. You know, all of the, and by the way, on both sides of this, all of the theological, all of the scriptural pressure is just in one direction, and it's pressing me to accept my guilt. It's it's never saying, oh, well, it's okay, it was somebody else's fault. None of this means that. Always in Scripture, it's coming back to me. Whether I'm going to Ezekiel 18, the soul that sins, it shall die. 
that chapter isn't about saying, oh, you don't have to worry about you yourself or your own guilt. Uh, I mean, after all, that was your dad, so you're okay. It's not saying that. It's saying you can't say, my dad didn't sin, so I must be okay. Or, well, I, I know, I, I know I'm, I'm sinning, but it's my dad's fault. It's, you know, it's him that's doing it. You've got to bear your own responsibility. Romans 14 is making the same point. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Sure enough. There, so I can't ever take that pressure off of myself. Don't hear anything I'm about to say as implying that I can say, well, that's not my fault. That's Adam's fault. The point is that as an individual, I have to accept my guilt. But the point is also that as a member of a community, I have to accept my guilt. Not just because other people did things that were wrong, but because my community, of which I am an inherent part, did something that was wrong. In Adam's fall, we sinned all? That's not just some mystical, weird statement that has some you know, metaphysical truth behind it somewhere. We're a part of the human community. Humanity has sinned. We have sinned, and we bear that. by As by one man, Romans 5 puts it this way, sin entered into the world and death by sin. It all comes in through Adam. And you could try to, we're, we're so, it's so weird to me that we're so much more comfortable explaining that away with some mystical uh, almost just abracadabra type statement. Well, in some mystical sense, his sin passes down to us. We're so much more comfortable with that than the obvious sociologically, empirically clear fact that we're part of the community that sinned. We are a part of Adam's race, and therefore we're guilty. It's not complicated when you begin to understand that your identity is not just selfish, that we exist both as an individual, a person by ourselves, and in a community, a person within a community belonging to others as well. David's census only makes sense this way. It was only a few episodes ago that we were covering the 50th Psalm and how some of those statements about the sacrifices and what God expects and demands and so on only really make the most sense in light of David's sin, uh, of the census, you know, taking the count of Israel. But do you read the lines in that sin in 1 Chronicles 21? Satan stood up against who? David? Uh, Satan stood up against Israel and so incited David to number Israel. If you're in Israel and you're only an individualist, you're like, man, I didn't even do anything. I was just sitting in my house. I didn't even participate in the census. Joab didn't even want to do the census. And yet what comes as a matter of it? God was displeased with this thing and he struck who? David? No. Israel. It's in verse 7 of 1 Chronicles 21. What, does God suddenly become unjust? Does he suddenly forget or just not know, anticipate what he's about to say to Ezekiel? The soul that sins, it shall die. Of course he knows what he's, his word is eternal. So, you know, this is when Israel is being stricken. They, they, something's gone wrong. David appeals to Gad. I, and and when, when he does, Gad says, well, you got three choices. I mean, I can either give you into the hands of your enemies or give you into a famine or put you into the hands of God into a pestilence. And David says to Gad in verse 13, I'm in a great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord. Let me, I am in a great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord. David hasn't been stricken by a plague, but he has because he's part of the community. He's part of Israel. And Israel has been stricken by a plague because they are part of the community of David. He is this messianic figure. And as their king, this messianic figure, they are experiencing the things that are in judgment of him. And David is experiencing the things too. There's no sense in David's mind, oh, thank heavens it was them and not me. I mean, for, for, for heaven's sake, I at least escaped. Are you kidding? David is lamenting. And so he says, I'm in a great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is very great. Don't let me fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, you heard it, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And, you know, it, it strikes me, this concept that we are, at, that our identity is wrapped up in the community of which we're a part, that, that concept is so difficult for us. And, I, you know, I've been studying for so many decades, it's just, 
it's just old hat to me. I mean, I just say it, and it's like, well, of course, it's, it's obvious. I mean, who doesn't know that? Well, very few of us know it. Very few of us live in a world where we talk about it that way. And so trying to emphasize it in discussions like this, I, I'm not trying to be pedantic, although I can't help it. And I'm, not, and I'm not trying to speak down to anyone. I am trying to reiterate something until our eyes open and we say, oh, 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 I see that. That when I say the words, I'm an American, or when I'm proud to be an alum of an institution, that what I'm acknowledging is that part of my identity is wrapped up in belonging to others, in having a we that I'm a part of. Uh, and because it's so unnatural to us, I'm, I'm drawn to, you know, give an example from uh, Jesse Weston's From Ritual to Romance. This is a, a work that I, as far as I know, is primarily famous only because T.S. Eliot relied on it for a lot of the imagery and symbolism that he used um, uh, in his creation of the, the Wasteland, you know, the poem The Wasteland. And so in that, and I think a lot of people don't understand what any of that imagery is about just because we don't read it very much. Not that it's difficult to understand, but, I, but, but let, me, let me explain it this way by saying when you, when you take this work by Jesse Weston, which goes through uh, the, the grail, you know, the search for the Holy Grail, the King Arthur tales, all that stuff that's part of Le Morte d'Arthur and all those kinds of works. When you take those works and put them together, there's a lot of imagery in that that comes from antiquity. I mean, from ancient Greece and other cultures around the world that are shared that have to do with a king who is his people and his land. And the people are reflected in the land and in the king and so on. And so in this one, for instance, there is, uh, she has a weird sort of table of contents and introductory section at the beginning of, of, of the book. And it describes it this way. Uh, there's a result. She's describing all these different forms of certain heroes like Gawain and so on. And then she's, and then there's a result of the primary task, the healing of the Fisher King. The Fisher King is always this uh, great King that's uh, whose illness is reflected in the illness of the land, the wasteland and so on. And so the healing of the Fisher King is a major image in all of these kinds of uh, stories that end up being matured into the Grail accounts later on. I'm not going to stay on this. Don't, don't, don't abandon me because I'm talking about literature for a moment. But I want to read you a little section from the first chapter of her work. It's not the opening, chap, uh, not the opening paragraphs, but in the middle of chapter one in Jesse Weston's work, she says this, throughout the whole study, the author fails to discriminate between the activities of the living and the dead king. The dead king may, as I've said before, be regarded as the benefactor, as the protector of his people, but it is the living king upon whom their actual and continued prosperity depends. The detail that the ruling sovereign is sometimes regarded as the reincarnation of the original founder of the race strengthens this point. The king never dies. Le Roy est mort. I can't speak French, so you'll just have to live with this translation. I mean, with this uh, transliteration. Le Roy est mort. Vive le Roy. Y you know, I mean, you hear that. The king is dead. Long live the king or live the king is very emphatically the motto of this faith. My point in reading that little section from the story is to emphasize that throughout all of history, all of history, people have identified with their heroic king and their fate was in his hands. And if he was healthy, they were healthy. And we see that in the stories of the Old Testament. And obviously, our culture is largely shaped by this uh, Judaic expression of it in the Old Testament, and then by the Christian expression of it in our Messiah in the New Testament. So it's not a surprise that it's in the culture. I'm not pretending those are not connected. But I am making the point that throughout all of history, people have done the same thing in other cultures as well, that there is an identity with your people that you can't escape because it's part of who you are and it's built into us and it's in all of those Fisher King stories in the, in the Grail Tales. And if you haven't read all of those or, 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 or read some book about all of them, you've just got to do that. Whether it's Le Morte d'Arthur or something else, you just got to be exposed to all of those stories to see how ingrained in our culture those ideas are and where they come out. So, so regarding our guilt, you know, the reason I bring that example up is to say regarding our guilt, it's like David with Israel. We should be able to acknowledge that the things we do as a culture in toto, and we don't think of ourselves as having a king, but we do choose heroes. 
We choose celebrities or political leaders to identify ourselves with, and we put them on posters, and we venerate them. You know, we celebrate their victories as if they're our victories. We won the election, you know, that kind of stuff. But all of doing that tells you that in our souls, we know it's still true about us. We just don't like to admit that it's still true about us, but it is. But that also means that, just like from Adam, the guilt flows both directions. And so, you know, I can, I can be some great leader of a people and say, well, that's them. That's not my fault. But if I'm part of that people, I carry the full burden of those people and vice versa, both directions. And it works that way with guilt. It works that way with salvation. And I'll keep this super short. But, you know, in Christ, when we talk about being in Christ, we can make it mystical and, and very, you know, mysterious and how to describe it as if that's the great mystery of the gospel. When in Ephesians, by the way, the great mystery of the gospel is that the Gentiles were to be included among those who were redeemed. That's, I mean, just it says it in Ephesians 3, as plain as the nose on your face, the mystery of the gospel, which was that all of those people were going to be included But what is it to be in Christ? In Ephesians 1, in our salvation, in our election, it is the fact that we were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world. He's the one who's chosen, and we reap the benefit of it because we corporately are in him. And how do we see that played out in our salvation, in the sanctification that we have, in the way that we live out our Christian lives? In Ephesians 4, it's because we are the body of Christ. The imagery there is not simply, you know, loose metaphorical comparisons. You know, it's as if we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We're living here in Christ, and he's living through us, and the things that we are doing are his testimony in the world. And that's why we're all held together by every joint with everything that was equipped when each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All of those descriptions of us being in Christ are a description of him living through us. And I mean us corporately because Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, that little section I was referring to just now, it's about us together. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith, unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's about the body of Christ measuring up to the fullness of Christ. It's the whole community. So why am I emphasizing all of this stuff about the community? Let me me, uh, lead to the close. Because our ethic is so significantly compromised when we don't understand who we are together and when we don't understand who we are together with. So our sharp delineation between we and they gives us latitude for excluding others from what we allow for ourselves. You hear that? Our sharp delineation between the we and the they gives us latitude, we think, for excluding others. I mean, it does. It gives us latitude for excluding others from what we allow to ourselves. We do it with immigration. We do it in the way we regard our neighborhoods. We do it when we talk about race. We do it between our denominations. We do it in our traffic interactions or on social media. And our willingness to create those moral lines, you know, we ought to treat them differently so that we can take care of our own, imply a recognition that there is a we, this is a good thing, this part, and not just an I. The problem with that is that we're willing to acknowledge our belonging only out to a certain line, and that line can change. I'm part of this group when I'm in a certain setting, and if if I'm over in, in a context where there are very few Christians, I don't care what denomination you are. I'm just glad to find another Christian. Here, you gotta be exactly the right breed of Baptist for me to be interested in relating to you. I don't mean that about me personally, although it's unfortunately been true about me uh, at plenty of times, but certainly I hope not now. The problem is that when we're willing to acknowledge our belonging only goes out to a certain line and that line changes, but then not beyond that, then we are putting ourselves in a position where we're going to violate what Scripture tells us to do because Scripture dictates that none of those lines, 
even though they are very real lines, they are very real concentric circular lines that move out from us where people are more and more distinct from us. Scripture dictates that none of those very real concentric circles of lines creates any moral segregation among us. Certainly not a real or justifiable moral segregation among us. That's why we're commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. Erase that line. Love the stranger as your own. Erase that line. Remove the barrier between Jew and Gentile. Erasing the line. That's why we speak of the Great Commission as universal. Erasing all the lines. Jesus models it. When he crosses every line, he touches the unclean, he embraces the beggar, he dines with sinners, he receives non-Jews, and gives them their requests, and he does every single one of those things with you. I'm just asking us to consider how well we've measured up to the full stature of Christ by evaluating, we can do this by evaluating how far out from the dead-centered self, beyond those concentric circles who are increasingly different from us, how far out has our empathy, our love, even our identity gone? That is, do I think I'm only this but not that? Does my empathy cross the line between being an American and being a Ukrainian or being a Russian? Does my love cross the line from my neighborhood to the neighborhood that's encroaching on my neighborhood? Does my empathy cross the line from the Atlantic Ocean to parts of Africa or Asia? The further outward our identification with others goes, the further outward our empathy for their condition is the closer we will be to what ought to be the center of our identity. The more we will look like we are not just in Christ, but centered in him. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at berrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.